afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session PS2, Seeing the Big Picture. I have the distinct honor of being the moderator for this session. My name is Mark Yedlin, and I'm aware that we have some very, very fine, interesting presentations for you, and I don't wish to take up any time away from our speakers. So our first speaker, our first presentation actually has two presenters. Uh, they are Ben Vincent and Chelsea Atkinson. So Ben is a highway design manager at the Western Federal Lands with 21 years of experience in the transportation industry. He works primarily on projects in Yellowstone National Park, improving the park road system and focus on laying lightly on the land. Previously, he worked at Washington State Department of Transportation in design, construction, and traffic operations with experience including interchange design, roundabouts, right-of-way acquisition, stormwater management, passenger rail service, signal operations, and traffic modeling. Ben is a ProSci certified change practitioner and WISDOT certified lean practitioner. He also coaches youth soccer and baseball. We won't ask questions on that later. <laughs> Chelsea is a project manager and transportation engineer at Jacobs with nearly 10 years of experience in the industry. She has experience with local, state, and federal clients across the country, but focused on the West. Chelsea works with clients to leverage innovation and best practices to deliver creative and efficient solutions that enhance quality of life. With no further ado, we are going to get started. So I welcome Ben. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we get the, the after lunch uh, session, so hopefully everybody can stay awake. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking uh, about the beginning of our, or the beginning of our presentation uh, about our projects, and Chelsea's going to follow up uh, to talk about some of the technical um, details about how we prepared the visualization. First, I want to ask a question. Who has ever heard of Western Federal Lands before? Wow, that is actually more than I expected. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't know, um, we are part of the Federal Highway Administration. Um, our office, there we, we have three divisions, um, Eastern, Central, and Western. And our job is to design and build road projects for federal land management agencies uh, for the rest of the government. So we work with primarily national parks, national forests, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, anywhere, any agency that owns land and needs roads, we are there to provide that service. Uh, we start from planning, we have design, we have um, geotech structures, survey, uh, hydraulics, we have labs, and we have construction staff. So we design the projects, we administer the construction. Um, like Mark said in, in the introduction, I have worked primarily for the last six years. My, my primary uh, projects have all been in Yellowstone National Park. They're our biggest uh, partner in Western Federal Lands. And when we work on park projects, uh, it's very different than DOT projects. Um, I don't know if you can read here. This is the, this is the Yellowstone Arch. It says for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. The park's mission is a lot different than a DOT mission. They're there to protect the land and to share it with the public. And when you visit a park, you're not just trying to get from point A to point B. You're there to experience your surroundings. Driving on the park roads is part of that experience. So we talk a lot about what's the visitor experience 
we talk about laying lightly on the land because when we build a road, we want it to fit into the environment. We don't want to have big, massive fills and cuts. We, we want it to look like it belongs there. Um, so we have a project that is called Norris to Golden Gate Phase 3. This is the Golden Gate is a, is a feature in Yellowstone National Park. It's a canyon. And it separates the Mammoth area from Swan Lake and, and points further south. This is what Golden Gate looked like in 1905. The first road through here was built in, I think, the 1880s. This is the original trestle. Um, by all accounts, it was terrifying. Um, uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote about it. Um, it's it's a, a wooden trestle. It's steep. Uh, it's wobbly. Uh, you're riding through here on a stagecoach. Um, people did not enjoy it. <laughs> but this is how you could get to the park, for, get, get into the rest of the park from Mammoth. So if you're going from Mammoth down to Old Faithful, you would, you would follow this road. Um, it was replaced in the 1930s by a viaduct. And you can see this is what the road through the Gardner Canyon looked like at that time. Uh, concrete viaduct, you can see how the road really hugs the edge of the canyon. And, and that is part of this historic view shed that we're, we're trying to maintain with our projects today. If you see in the, in the second picture, you can see a stagecoach uh, rounding that corner. So uh, in the 1930s, uh, the Bureau of Public Roads, which was the predecessor to FHWA, tried to build a tunnel there. Um, unfortunately, it collapsed during construction and they abandoned that effort and made it an open cut. And that, all the rock they pulled out of there became a material source for other projects. And this is now what Golden Gate looks like today. So this is, that, this is the same, um, you can see where the cars are parked, that's the same spot where the tunnel was. You can see how once that tunnel collapsed and I had to cut all that out, it really changed the, the way the face of that cliff looked it, because it, it moved it back. And uh, aerial view you can see going through the canyon. So we have a project to widen the road and, re and rebuild the road, bring it up to current standards through Golden Gate. Uh, existing road is about 22 feet wide. We're gonna widen it up to 30 feet. We've got rockfall issues here, so we wanna put a, put a rockfall ditch in so that we have less rock fall on the road. There was a rock that landed on the viaduct two weeks ago and put a hole in the deck. So we want to avoid that. Um, the big concern is let's do all this, we do all this to cut. What is the canyon gonna look like when we're done? We can draw those lines on, the, on, on plans. We can show where our cut li limits are, but is it gonna feel the same? or is it gonna be wide open? Right now when you drive through the canyon, you, you go around these curves and you get different views every time you go around a curve. And that's really important to the park to maintain that character of the road. And it's really hard to look at a 2D plan set and see, is it gonna feel the same? It's even hard for our designers to know, is it gonna feel the same when they're looking at a 3D model? So what we decided to do is do a visualization. And we, so we could all get on the same page and see what will this look like? What will it feel like to drive through? And this is our visualization video.
One of the other things we were looking at uh, as part of this visualization is this new parking area. It's much bigger than the existing parking area. And we wanted to see how visible will cars be when they're parked there? Because you really don't want to see light shining off windshields for a mile and a half as you're approaching. So it's actually in this visualization shows it's more visible than we wanted. So we made some changes after to, to shape the, the contours there so to hide that parking lot a little bit more. You notice that pillar of rock there that was that was in the original road and it was something that was important to maintain all throughout the improvements for the last 140 years. Um, so we've been able to do that. Okay, I'm going to be followed by Chelsea. She's going to talk, uh, Chelsea's from Jacobs. Um, they did the actual, uh, pr produced the visualization for our office. So she's going to talk about some of the process that went into that. All right, thank you. Okay, so. As you could see in the visualization video, we wanted it, well hopefully you could see, we wanted it to look really realistic. So our team started with the Bentley Open Roads model as the backbone of the design because we wanted this visualization to be a really high fidelity representation of what you would see once the actual construction was complete and what the final design would look like. Um, we took that model and we merged it with the existing terrain to create a terrain surface that could provide that representation for, um, for our design. And then we went into Autodesk 3DS Max and Vray to do the um, render, or to do the actual, um, the actual um, overlay of the, of the visualization itself. And then Adobe Premiere and After Effects was utilized for the compositing and the motion graphics and the final compiling of the automation. So you can see um, on screen kind of the actual terrain model down there. It's a full model of the entire corridor that was designed and gives really representative slopes of what things are actually going to look like, what the actual elevations are. Um, so the visualization is, is not just a representation of what it's going to look like. It's really true to the design. Um, and then you can also see some of the in-process uh, visualization development. From there, we took it into a virtual review studio, which is the screenshot that you see on screen, which was a really important part of our visualization process because it gave the opportunity for live markups and to create a really collaborative um, environment with the design team and the visualization team to make sure that what was being shown was representative of the design intent. And in some cases to maybe um, cause some conversation about if what was showing in the model was not what the design intended and if there were things that needed to be tweaked um, in that process. So I think in this screenshot, we were talking about that rock slope. The slopes that you saw in the video are representative of the type of material face that is intended. So as it was shown here, it was a little bit too much of that um, bumpy rock slope and it's going to be more of the smooth cut slope that you see further back. So we changed the visualization um, so that you can really 
really get that feel of what it's going to look like and so that the folks in the park reviewing it and all of the constituents can know if they're comfortable with how things are going to look um, and that they can what they can expect and then we took it from there to the next step of rendering um, that can be a really time intensive process so we wanted to make sure that we had the virtual review studio first so that we're not rendering it repeated times that we're just getting that smooth visualization once or twice really finalizing it um, and making sure that we get the video that we can post and share and people can access um, via a link for those conversations that we wanted to have with um, the entire group. And then that brings us to the visualization itself, um, which you got to see. And then it was shared with all of the stakeholders and the team um, through that method. So we have some fun pictures here. Um, this is a picture of kind of at the base, right near the parking lots. You can see there's some folks standing on the side of the road, which is not usually ideal, but does happen a lot in Yellowstone. There's folks that, um, you know, it's a beautiful place, so they want to get out of their cars. So this is the actual picture. And then this is the same shot from our 3D visualization. And that shows the new path that's going to go on there. We're going to be able to get pedestrians off of the roadside but it really shows pretty much the exact same view and what that's gonna look like. You know, with the, with the creek still meandering through, with the new bridge, how visible it's gonna be from the road, um, kind of enables you to make some choices about maybe the materials for the slatting on the long, alongside it, what, what type of things we can do to help it blend into the environment, but still provide um, the usage that we need. Got another one here. So this is that parking area that Ben talked about where the, the former um, tunnel was potentially going to be. And now it's a highly utilized lookout area. And you could see in the video, we did a little pull in section and looked back. So you could see the waterfall that all these folks are taking pictures of. Um, and so that's a little bit of a fun addition in the video that we wasn't necessary to communicate the design, but adds a little pizzazz. So from this view, you can see that once we widen it, the rock cut's going to look a little bit different. We're adding a protected path alongside it, but this is really the same, the same view. It fulfills the same purpose, and it gives folks looking at it a lot of comfort and understanding of what that view is going to look like um, once, once the design's complete. It's also pretty exciting. You can kind of see in this, in this image the the real 3D aspect of it. It shows how you're going to like see the, the very edge of the mountain coming through that canyon and helps give people an understanding of what that feeling is going to look like and what elements in the entire surrounding topography you're going to be able to see because of their elevations. So that's most of the actual visualization itself. I'm going to let Ben wrap us up with some lessons learned on the experience. Just let people any questions. So, um this was very well received by our partners in the park. Um, we, we do work with some engineers in the, in the park service, but a lot, of the, a lot of the people that we work with on these projects are scientists or uh, they have other backgrounds. So I look at plans every day. I can usually think, I can usually envision what something's gonna look like by looking at plans, but not everybody can do that. And we don't expect everybody to do that. This is, was a really great eye opener for some of the people on our projects. Like they finally understood this is what it's gonna look like. And I actually was in a meeting two weeks ago and they asked, hey, are we gonna do another video like we did on this project for, you know, for this next one that we're working on? Because that, that was made such a difference for me. So it was great feedback. Um, it also made a big difference in decision making. So the park was, was really reluctant to commit to an option when there was still some doubt about how things were going to turn out. This made them a lot more comfortable with, with making a decision and moving forward with the plan. And if I could do this again, I would have started this a lot earlier. We were, um, we were after 70% before we decided to do this, this visualization. And you know, we could have probably accelerated the project a little bit more, got some decisions made earlier if we had done this earlier in the process. I, I don't think it would have hurt. It's a little bit more tricky uh, when you, you don't have quite as refined of a design, but I think it would have been worth doing. What are your questions?
So we kind of studied the, the scenes like a before and after. Kind of studied sometimes you'd see split video as the car drives through and you show a before of the bomb and then or the vice versa at the top. Were there some consideration ever given to that so that people could see, okay, here's what I could see now and here's what I'm going to see as I drive through <coughs> at the same time? We didn't really consider that for this uh, project. There was another project where um, we used that a little bit more. Um, it's just, it wasn't, it wasn't the focus for what we wanted to convey here. Yeah, it definitely is a good technique. Um, no, so we have terrestrial survey, uh, aerial, LIDAR, and photogrammetry. Um, the park service has been very reluctant to allow any drones in any parks until this summer. So as some of you know, uh, there were some floods in Yellowstone this year. We, we did some emergency projects. Uh, we made great use of drones. It, it was phenomenal uh, how much it, it made an impact. Um, and it was a lot easier for the park to accept that because the public wasn't around. The big issue is if you know, the average visitor sees a survey drone flying around, they're gonna think, well, I can fly my drone now. You know? <laughs> and that's what they wanna avoid. Yeah, uh, the, we have flown air, um, fixed wing aerial LIDAR, yep. So it was LIDAR used for like the base mesh and then the design model built into that. Yep. Uh, first of all, very good answer. Um, what made you decide to, since you started with Desert Nomads, what made you decide to leave the LIDAR Yeah. So um, Jacobs is working with us on another project in Yellowstone, and they produced a, a, a visualization for that project, and that, that's the Yellowstone River Bridge, a uh, brand new bridge replacement. And that went over very well with, with the park and with us. Um, we really liked the way it looked, so we thought let's, we can do the same thing here. We were also trying to figure out um, do we have the capability to do this internally? So we have Luminar-T, we, we've used it a little bit. Um, it's not nearly as detailed as what we got this way. Uh, we learned very quickly that no, we don't have the capability to do this ourselves. <laughs> uh, you know, with how much time and uh, we went into developing it and all of the uh, software that we just don't have, uh, it made more sense. It makes more sense for us to go outside, I think, in the future as well, if we're gonna do more. And we have used LuminRT for some similar efforts going from open roads. I think for this type of effort, we really wanted to have those like slightly more artistic elements than what you can get through that program. Like the rock face walls are like pretty manually designed to be representative of what we expect and kind of adding in that water feature just taking it beyond a representation of the model to the next level of like experiencing the feel that the driver would feel. And I know when we did the review with the, with the modelers who were actually developing it, that, I mean, it was an interesting challenge for them to, to represent all that the way they did. They, they enjoyed it and they did a great job. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Bigger question called, how long did it take? <laughs> <laughs> to do the visualization or? I mean, obviously the design was, took a long time. Um, yeah, let us know the time. Yeah, I'm not sure on an hour's basis how long it took. Um, it wasn't an extremely lengthy process as far as like they handed over the design. It was probably a few weeks of back and forth um, until we had the visualization. Is that your I, recollection? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to dig back. I remember memory. looking at the bill and, you know, the, <laughs> the hours were itemized and it was a lot. And, you know, that's why I say we couldn't do it internally because they had multiple yeah. people working on it and we didn't have the staff. But I don't remember now uh, how many hours it was. Yeah, the time frame as far as accumulative hours is a bit different because there is a whole team that really helped put it together. Um, I said I needed my uh, position as moderator to fill in this one. <laughs> okay. Um, 
for great presentation. You mentioned that you would have liked to have started early mm -hmm. with your learning. So if you had more time, what is it that you would have done in learning in particular that you think is important to your work? So um, this came out exactly the way that we wanted it to. Um, but by the time we developed it, we pretty much already committed to the solution. And this just helped reinforce people's decisions. We're working on another project um, where we are still in the alternatives analysis phase. And we've got multiple alternatives that have pros and cons. So what I'm thinking now is once we get a little bit further with those, maybe we model multiple alternatives and then give people a chance to see those. And it'll, it'll help with selecting and, and uh, winnowing those down. Our next presenter is Cameron Schmeitz. He's a research associate at the Dallas-Fort Worth region for the Center of Transportation Research of the University of Texas at Austin. He started working on visualization in 2009 as a graduate research assistant at UT Austin. After getting his graduate degree in 2011, he started as a research fellow working full-time at the LBJ project doing visualization. Over the past 13 years, his experience has included 3D and 4D modeling, virtual reality, and gaming engines to assist Textos with engineering analysis and public communication. This is Cameron's fourth visualization symposium. So I will welcome him in 30 seconds as we bring up his presentation. Perspective? Yes, I'm set. Very good. Thank you, Mark. So I wish I would have picked a shorter title, but uh, here we go. So we're going to be driving through a complex weaving section with an immersive driver's level of video with VISM traffic. So myself, uh, I'm Cameron. Um, this work is supported by, um, overall by my boss, Nabil, and then um, my partner in crime, Juan Loiza, um, is also working on this as a team. And just want to throw out a thank you to our project sponsor, uh, Textot. So I want to go through the project real quick so you have some context, but I know you all will forget that. So um, this is the North Town Express Segment 3C project, $950 million dollars public-private partnership, 6.7 miles of uh, 35W. So 35 runs through the whole country. You see it there. We're on the Fort Worth side, so it splits. It has about uh, 150,000 um, daily um, you know, vehicles, and 11% of those are trucks. So the gist of the project is we need more capacity. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take everything, move it out, put some managed toll lanes in the middle, and um, yeah. So we started the project, started construction, we were looking at the schematic, and we were thinking, man, there's no way to get into the managed lanes, and so it's a highway within a highway, we've got to provide access, it's barrier divided. There's no way to get into the um, managed lanes northbound, like we have six miles of project, and it's all exits. So no one can really get into the managed lanes from the project. Now we've got other segments that are feeding into this, so they have entrances, but it's kind of weird um, that we didn't have any northbound managed lane entrances. And um, there is a major mixed use traffic generator um, right where we are looking at. So it was like, we really could use something right here. Like I think people would use this if we had it. And so uh, that just kind of got our brains thinking and we did end up developing, you know, um, this change order, and it is going through. So the challenges with this change order is uh, kind of geom geometrical, political. So it is an additional managed lane ramp, and it's a tolled managed lane. So, you know, uh, we're going to be adding more access to toll lanes. And in Texas, toll lanes, you know, are a little bit, uh, the, the hot button issue. 
And so, um, you know, so there's that part of it. Then also it's going to have a forced entrance into that tolled facility. So I think if you can see there, um, that lane is going to be forced entrance. And we try not to have forced entrances into tolled facilities. It's, you know, it's, they call it the hamburger rule is if I'm eating a hamburger and I look up and I'm on a tolled facility, I didn't, I didn't really choose that, you know, um, the weaving that is created by um, adding this new ramp, which is downstream of, you know, the exit ramp is about 900 feet. And um, the geometry of the entrance ramp is kind of wonky. You can see on the, on the second picture there, uh, we went from a one lane exit um, upstream here to a, yeah, pointer. So this was a one lane exit uh, because, um, of traffic, we changed it to a two lane exit, but that meant that we created this kind of, uh, it was a, you know, the this lane merges really quickly. So this geometry is just kind of, it's an interesting, interesting merge. And as Ben had talked about, our project manager, if he's gonna be recommending this change, you know, um, where we are, you know, adding managed lanes and there's just this interesting entrance and this weave. He wanted to make sure he wasn't, you know, going to be yelled at and he wanted to do his due diligence. And what he told me is he wanted to feel it. And he tells me all the time, I want to feel it. I want to feel it. So, you know, Ben's project is, I want to, you know, you're feeling, you're looking at all this great, beautiful scenery. Ours is, what's it going to feel like to go through this crazy weave in 900 feet? And how, what does that feel like as a driver? So model creation, civil elements, um, then we textured the elements. We did, um, you know, this was a progressive thing. So we did a kind of a drive through without any vehicles and kind of just, you know, looked at the geometry. You know, is that, you know, is that enough information? Do you feel it? Um, are you comfortable with it? No, let's try to add some vehicles. Okay, then we added some, you know, must call those dumb vehicles which are just kind of vehicles that follow a line and go a certain, um, a certain speed. Uh, as you're going through the merge, having the dumb vehicles and trying to, you know, change lanes, it didn't work out. We didn't even render it because it just looked awful. We were just crashing into every single vehicle. So we quickly realized that um, we're going to try to use VISM vehicles. And so I'll talk about VISM in a, vehicle in a second. After we had added the VISM vehicles, we added as much detail as we could as possible. Like I said, we're trying to feel it. So can we add lighting? Can we add signs? Can we add, um, you know, surrounding so it doesn't look like you're floating? And then we did our rendering. So real quick, here's that draft drive through entrance. So you can see if you can feel it yourself. So this is, you're on the front of the road and you want to get to that managed lane ramp. So this is just an animated camera along some curves. Let's go to the next one. This is the other part of that, which is taking the exit and then getting over to the frontage road. So we, the main movement that we were thinking was the people that are gonna use the managed lane entrance ramp are coming from the frontage road because the general purpose lanes a while back, they already had their entrance about a couple miles ago. And there were no new ramps that were adding traffic to the outside lanes. So it's really, you know, this, the movement of, actually this movement um, of taking the exit and then getting on the entrance is not, is not, we don't think it's gonna be very used. So what did we get out of that? We did check civil visibility. And what I mean by civil visibility, if you're exiting the ramp, can you see the other traffic on the other side? You know. Um, earlier you can see the traffic, the more you can try to find your spot. It's called, you know, finding your, your point in the merge. 
And we did get some feeling, you know, you are moving, you're moving, it's not static, it's not an image, you know, we're moving at, um, you know, we can program the speed. So you get some feeling of how long you're gonna be in this weave, is it 10 seconds, is it four seconds, is it two seconds? So you get some of it, but can we do more? Can we get that feeling? So that's where we decided to um, add the cars and we added the VizSim car. So VizSim, real quick, is a micro simulation traffic modeling software. I'm not a traffic person. Our traffic uh, team did all this. So um, huge uh, shout out to them. And so if you are a traffic person, they told me that we used design hourly volumes. I hope that means something to someone. And uh, micro simulation means that we are modeling every single vehicle, which is different than platooning. That's important because, you know, we're gonna visualize every single vehicle. So the process for this um, is interesting. I think it's like five different softwares that we used to get the traffic to line up precisely. You know, you don't wanna have like something going through the gore or driving over there. So you've got to try to match up your civil geometry with your VisSim um, geometry. And so um, the coordinating of that is, um, it was a learning experience. So here's our final, um, our final uh, visuals that we presented. So this is just kind of given if anyone didn't know exactly where they were. So there is, um, this project's currently under construction. And so, you know, all of this has to be simulated and visualized because right up, out there right now is just, just dirt. <laughs> so as you can see the cars, we're in a car, which is good because you're gonna drive in a car. The other cars are moving, driving, changing lanes. And uh, we take this exit. So in VisSim, we programmed all the number of cars. You program the speed limits, um, what speed you want your cars to go to. It is, I mean, it's designed to analyze traffic. So um, it's, they do a lot more of colla um, not collaboration. Um, I'll, I'll remember the word. Um, so really what it is is for me, and I've had to try to train our traffic people or l not make them freak out when I ask for cars. It's like, I just want cars that don't run into each other. I just want some smart cars. And they're like, oh, traffic's, you know, and I, I get it, traffic's hard and you're predicting things and you have to test it and retest it and calibrate it. That's the word. They want to calibrate their model. And I'm like, I just want some cars, you know, I just want to want some, you know, so, um, so yeah, so we're not analyzing traffic with VisSim. We are supporting our visualization with cars. Did I show that? We just did that one. Okay, let's do the next one, sorry. I'm trying to talk in. So this is the frontage road part, the entrance. So they've got to get over, if you're in the right lane, you've got to go over three lanes, you know, to get into that entrance. And that's the reason we had to, for we were trying to do this balance of, okay, we need to give people time on the frontage road to get over, you know, three lanes. And if we didn't have that third lane be able to get to the entrance, then, you know, they have to get over four lanes. Um, so this third lane right here is kind of the sweet spot because you get that choice. You can go in, or you cannot go in. But here's that kind of weird, you know, the left lane and right lane start to taper before the gore. So um, we tried to make it as realistic, realistic and Im as immersive as possible. And the reason we want that is we're trying to trigger that driver's instinct. You know, people have been, you've been driving since you've been 16. And so uh, you know what things 
safe road and safe maneuvers feel like? And so can we kind of, you know, tap into that? Um, so we did that. You, all, you saw all the 3D objects, and then we have the traffic. We have um, the, uh, you know, the, the signs, the pavement markings. So my question to you is, did you feel like you had enough time? Did you feel like you had enough space? Did you feel like you had adequate signage so you can choose what lane you want to be in? So how did it work out? We were the qualitative part of the analysis for our project manager. And so um, you know, they have a, uh, a GEC team um, that did you know, the civil analysis. They did uh, their own traffic analysis as well. And so um, well, I would say that he, he trusts you know, that team. And so, um, you know, our part was the qualitative part of it. And so, you know, he was able to review it. The whole team was able to review it. You know, it did help them out. We did use it to review um, pavement markings and signs. So we rendered, you know, some big 40, 4K videos, put it up on the big, um, the big screen. And, you know, that way it's even a little more immersive and um, to review the signs and markings because you've got, you know, all these lane changes and stuff. And then our project team did use the videos and uh, rendered images to brief the district administration. And I think what that did is it, it made it easier for them to understand, but also it gave another layer of authenticity to the project team's review. Like, okay, yep, did you look at traffic? Did you look at, you know, this weave? Yep, check, check, check. Oh yeah, did you, you know, did, did the, they sign off on all the, you know, the very important engineering, um, you know, designs and uh, yes, check. Oh, and yeah, we also did a drive-through visualization with uh, traffic. Oh, okay, yeah. So it lent, you know, he's, he's going in and they're proposing this kind of semi-controversial new ramp. Um, he wanted to have as much information and, um, you know, validation as possible that it was, it was going to work and it was going to be okay. And so having all of these things and going above and beyond with a visualization, um, you know, lent them a lot of credibility when they went and talked to the district administration. So a couple of quotes, feedbacks from them. Um, like I had said, he trusted the engineering analysis, but what he told me is he would always be wondering. It would be like a question in the back of his mind, just wondering, is it going to work until he can drive on it? And so for him, he felt like he, did, he was able to drive on it, and it did give him that confidence. And one thing that I found was interesting was, you know, we had a, a new deputy project manager come in and we were reviewing those signs and you know just getting in a big conference room and looking at it and he's like this is so cool we can review things like this and i just remember that quote going on so um yeah that's that's i don't have a fancy thank you slide or question slide but that's the work that we did um on trying to make you feel it ben talked about it and i remember him saying we want to get them to feel it and it's a uh, it's a little bit different of a feeling, but you know we're trying to tap into the get as immersive as possible, so you can see if you can can we make you feel like you're in a car. And I wish I had a big, awesome driving simulator, but we don't have the funding for that. But if someone wants to fund it, then I'll put you on a slide ship, a slide two. <laughs> Mark, I'm good for questions or. Oh, good. It was good. It was convincing. Uh, so I had a couple of related questions. One is uh, the modeling of the roadway and the building line, as well as the rendering, the realistic rendering, and the, the whole animation. Was it all done within Vision, or was that some other software? Microsoft Paint. We did everything in Microsoft Paint. Okay. No. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a collection. So. Um, Civil was done in Open Rose Designer. Um, 3ds Max was texturing and then adding in all of our metal beam guard fence and you know other kind of um, you know traffic elements. Um, we brought in the Viz Sim into 3D 3ds Max and then everything was exported out to Unreal and rendered out of Unreal. And so um, and that's mostly for because v-ray takes a long long time and unreal is a lot faster that, that makes sense so uh, and the other related question you talked about the fact that we try to make it as immersive as possible was it uh, possible to uh to watch 
The immersive part was um, trying to, you know, just kind of like, you know, to kind of see if you, they you know that driver's perspective to see, to feel it. We, you know, uh, once you have all the, all of the, um, the, the, the model and the animations, it's a, it's only a little bit more work. So we could, you know, go into um, a virtual reality. We kind of had that drafted. You know, a lot of this was done kind of during the pandemic, so the videos made a lot more sense from a deliverable perspective. Um, but it's still my dream to finish up that, you know, um, VR capable experience. Um, just because I feel like that's the ultimate pinnacle. We have a driving wheel, we have VR, we have pedals. So if you can drive on the road, you're in control of the car, you're in control of where you look, you've got real traffic that's going to hit you then that's really feeling it. Um, it is a little bit more of an effort and this just kind of was uh, a little bit easier to distribute, especially during, we did a lot of VR before COVID and you know, after uh, we had to find other ways to deliver things. Um, we looked at rendering out 360 video. Um, Unreal can do 6K and um, we use Resolve, the free version, um, and you can only export out a 4K 360 image, a video, and I just don't think that's gonna be good enough for the headset. So, um, you know, I'd like to get an 8K 360, but Unreal only goes to 6K. So, you know, that 360 video would've been a little bit more distributable, but there were some technical challenges, both with Unreal and uh, with ours. Uh, you know, like Adobe Premiere can export out um, a higher resolution 360 and, and resolve can, but the expense and, and time of it just didn't fit for us. Yes, Mark. visualization tools did not reflect the focus of the VR, which meant that when you saw the sign in the visualization, it not necessarily reflected the same distance of time that would occur in the real world. And I don't know how much better these things have gotten. I had to really, really, really tinker with the software to actually change the field of vision for the rendering. Yeah, signage on, yeah, so the human eye versus what you can see on there. And that's why I'm always careful of saying, you know, like, you know, there's, I think, you know, it's like a arc, a 160th arc second is what the human eye can see. And, uh, but, you know, I think that the test, because we've looked at it a lot, we've looked at the, the test uh, for getting, you know, your eye test is a 2040. So you look at the inches on the, of the, of the text and you should say, okay, you should be able to see it here, but you're right, you can't. And that's the reason we had to, we tried the best we could is we got the big 75 inch TV and we rendered it in 4K on a 4K TV because um, that's the best that you know we could do. And so yeah, reviewing, reviewing signs, especially for when you can see it, um, you kind of gotta, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. So we weren't saying, you know, we weren't looking, we, we know that problem exists. And so, you know, 4K, 4K was a high, you know, a, I think a reasonably high display, rendering out at 4K, reviewing on a big TV to try to get it as close to eye as possible. So what I would say is I think we've made progress, but from my research in, you know, 
trying to learn a little bit about human factors. I know there's a lot of stuff in there. It's not there yet. So you do have to be careful with claiming that you can see something, at a, you know, just because you can't see, you can't read the sign in the visualization at a certain distance, that is not real life. And um, that's the problem that I've always talked about with virtual reality is, is that you have to be careful about what you're claiming in virtual reality. And um, it's the same with science. So yeah, you, you definitely hit the, head on the more, on, hit the head on that one with that you know, continuing problem. So maybe with 8K, I, I don't know, I forget what resolution you have to get to where your pixels correlate to the differing you can see in your eye. Um, but you know, that, that's one area where you know, pixel count and size and viewing distance um, you know, needs, to, needs, to, needs to happen. Well, let's give a round of applause for Cameron. I think that was a great presentation. Our next speaker is Jamie Bufkin. She is an urban and regional planning student at the University of Florida living in Washington, DC. She's passionate about making cities more bicycle and pedestrian friendly and reimagining car-centric suburbs to be more human-centric oriented. Following her graduation in December 22, she will be working at the Washington Metropolitan Council of Governments as a transportation planner. I ask her to please come forward. Hi, hello everyone. So yes, my name is Jamie. Um, I'm currently a MERP student and so I took a little bit of a different approach to visualization, more so using it as a simple tool, um, particularly to understand how residents in a quickly growing suburban town in Florida perceive increased density. Move that out of the way. Okay. So I started this research just thinking about sprawl at first and all the many problems that it causes, whether it be increased traffic, you know, air pollution, noise pollution, just pure car dependency and how that really negatively shapes our lives. And that's particularly true in Florida. And so these three maps come from the Florida 2070 project, which was spearheaded by a thousand friends of Florida and UF. So they use LUCIS, which is the uh, a land use modeling tool to understand how different land use planning decisions will influence the entire landscape of Florida. So in the middle picture, we see that this is the trend of how the state will look in 2070 if we just continue to sprawl, if we just continue to you know, um, build for automobile dependency. Whereas in the third map, uh, this is the alternative, where if we choose to build more compactly and if we choose to adopt more smart growth planning policies. And so I think I know which one I would rather have and so at the crux of this is the direct relationship between land use and transportation. And so when we consider how to approach street design, we also have to consider how we approach land use. And so, you know, we might ask who are the users of this street? You know, what should the speed be? What design controls will be most effective to bring that speed to what we want it to be? And more specifically in this context, how will the future land use changes influence street design? 
And so I think that this figure from the city of Leander, Texas, does a really good job at communicating how uh, a built environment that's shaped around the car differs from a more human-centered environment. So, you know, no one wants to be walking in that top right picture, but you do want to spend time in that bottom right one. So with all this in mind, I wanted to ask myself about my hometown of St. Cloud, which I'll touch on very soon. Um, more particularly wondering about how these residents perceive increased density in their downtown, and how does this compare to their perceptions of recent sprawling developments, and what are the hindrances to increasing density in downtown at all? So very quickly, I just did an online survey through Qualtrics. I got 53 respondents. I also held two semi-structured interviews with two St. Cloud city planners and one MPO planner from Metro Plain Orlando. And then I also assessed the land development code of the city to try to understand whether the code even allows increased density or whether it discourages increased density. So St. Cloud is about 45 minutes south of Orlando, located in Osceola County, and it's just uh, east of Kissimmee, Florida. Right now there's about 64,000 people. It's growing pretty quickly at 3.9%, which is way faster than the 3% uh, statewide growth rate. It's mostly white, and you can call it a bedroom city because about 90% of the residents who are employed actually have to commute out of the city for work. So, you know, there's not a lot of employers in the city. So, unfortunately, this is a PDF, so I can't show you the um, prior imagery, but in 1985, on the left that you can't see, much of all of this land was um, agricultural land, ranch land, just very rural land. But over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so, growth has instead um, spiraled into subdivisions. But if you look at the up here, this is the historic core, which is made of a very tight, it's made up of a very tight knit street, street grid. So like, you know, a very good grid that you would want to preserve and expand upon. But over time, it just rippled outwards down south. And so, you know, no, no changes have occurred in downtown, but all the growth has been accommodated in subdivisions such as that. So through my survey, I just asked some simple demographic questions, and I asked them to uh, give their attitudes on the recent development trends. I asked them where they agree or disagree on some general land use planning statements. And then I asked them to give their rated perception of density of different hypothetical designs on a scale of one to five. And then I just asked their general feelings towards increasing density as opposed to sprawl. And I asked for their uh, preferred design. So th this just is an example of um, some of the recent developments and what the participants were shown. And this is where the modeling took place um, using SketchUp. So the red part of New York Avenue is where I focus the detailed modeling, very detailed buildings, whereas in the um, larger box, that's where I just did simple white box to show the context. And so, you know, far less sophisticated than, you know, using Civil and Bentley systems, I just use SketchUp um, because this was just part of my master's thesis and time was kind of, you know, at stake here. So this shows the different alternatives, starting with the existing at the top. Um, but I just incrementally added taller buildings um, and added whether it be more outdoor space, more green space, played with the parking, played with adding street trees. Um, and so the fourth alternative is the most dense, and it goes up to six stories. But then um, alternative one is pretty similar to the existing conditions and it only goes up to two stories. Um, but yeah, as you move forward, you're taking away existing buildings and you're you know, going higher and higher. So as a P it's a PDF, so you can't see, but this is a GIF image, which is what the participants were shown. So 
Each alternative was shown in the perspective of the pedestrian. So the participant would watch each GIF and kind of simulate the act of walking through the downtown. So getting to the results, when asked about the recent developments, 58 people left open responses. And what, that's what stuck to me when, when thinking about traffic is that, um, and transportation is that over half of the comments, you know, complained about the traffic and the infrastructure concerns um, with regard to these new recent developments. Uh, that followed by environmental concerns because as I said, you know, St. Cloud was very much a very rural and agricultural focused town. But, you know, over the years that has j very much changed. So this is just an example of some of the quotes. You know, St. Cloud's being overbuilt. Infrastructure and roads are not keeping up with the overgrowth. No new roads to handle the thousands of new residents and cars. We're operating on infrastructure that was meant for a tiny ag agricultural town. Residents who have been born and raised in St. Cloud are having their land taken over by people thinking they are adding to the small town life. Too many houses in a small area of land, especially areas of land historically used for agricultural purposes, which is, this is a very good example of that. That was all uh, cattle ranch land. All the housing developments feel crowded and is increasing population, which is increasing traffic. I found this one interesting because they perceive, you know, developments that look like this as crowded. So I'm like, oh, they probably won't like my alternative designs then. Um, so when looking at the demographic results, you know, the average participant lives in a suburban house. They're going to be 51 or older. They've lived in St. Cloud for at least 10 years, and they probably did not live in a downtown urban setting before. So when looking at the perceived level of density of the alternative designs, we see that most people are content with the existing conditions. So the orange means, you know, just right. They're really happy with how things are. When I introduce the second alternative, slightly more people also perceive that to be just right. But then when we get into alternative two, which is where we get to three stories, and where we actually start to redevelop lots and redevelop buildings, that, dr that dramatically falls down. So now that's perceived as too dense, too high, even just at three stories. And so obviously with alternative four and five, that's just far too dense, way too much of a change. So when I asked, I asked the participants whether they think that sprawl is harmful and whether they think that compact development can you know, be a solution to those problems. So I found that participants do agree that sprawl has harmed Florida, but they don't think that compact development can avoid those problems, which, you know, there's, there's a, it's kind of inconsistent in thought. So it's like, what do they think the solution is exactly if it's not sprawl, if, and if it's not compact development? And then there are also clear disagreements over how the future growth should be accommodated. So I asked whether they would prefer to continue suburban sprawl or if they would rather see the growth be accommodated in, more a, in a more compact manner. And so we have 45% who say they would see, they would like to see more densification and then 40% who would not. And then the other 15%, uh, those people just express pure, you know, disregard for any sort of change. You know, they think that you should stop all growth, but that's not really possible. Um, you know, they express uh, increase in traffic concerns again. Again, destruction of small town character and ecosystem destruction. So when I controlled for the zip code, this is where we get, you know, a little bit more interesting results because, um, this northern zip code here, this is where downtown is. And the people who live there, they are, more, they are less likely to favor densification over sprawl to accommodate future growth. Whereas the zip code down here, which you'll find more suburban sprawl and more rural lands, those people actually um, would like to see more densification 
And so all I can do is kind of infer as to why this is, but my guess would be that these people feel like the densification in downtown is more personal and they would be more affected by it. So when asked what the most preferred alternative was, we see that you know most do want things to stay how they are. However, when you take into account all of the other alternatives at once, collectively there's more people who would like to see some level of densification in downtown as opposed to nothing. So that is, you know, good. And then from the interview results, I would say the main takeaways are that the market is at play here when it comes to no densification occurring in downtown. You know, the cost of infill development is pretty high, but also the public and the um, decision makers negative perception of density does very much come at play um, in blocking densification from occurring. Um, you know, density is relative. Like I said, those developments aren't really dense to me, but to them it is because the lot sizes have gotten smaller over time. Um, and so ultimately, the, the county, Osceola County, will densify in the future, you know, whether or not St. Cloud likes it, and that is very much going to affect how St. Cloud's land use planning will shape. So I think that from all of this, it's the role of the planner to inform the public about the built environment, and I think that visualization is pretty underutilized when it comes to, you know, um, upzoning or making changes to land use. Um, and so when it comes to St. Cloud, in cities like St. Cloud that are full of people who are just so hesitant to see any uh, intensification or densification, I think that's where visualization can really be used as a tool to, you know, show them what it will feel like and, you know, show them how it can blend into your small town. It can, you know, keep St. Cloud as a small town, whereas, whereas this sprawl is what's actually destroying their small town character. But in the future, if I had more time, um, I would adopt more sophisticated <coughs> visualizations, such as incorporating more rendering like Lumion um, and showing more, like having uh, vehicles move and people move and um, incorporate some sounds so it feels more realistic. And these are supposed to be videos, but um, I think that if, you know, I were to take on this research in the future, I would definitely um, adopt something like this. Um, but Qualtrics, which is what I used for the online survey, um, had like a limit of 100 megabytes per file, so I couldn't, you know, incorporate very sophisticated modeling. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's it, and I think that, you know, I hope that local governments try to adopt more in-house visualizations that are simple um, when it comes to engaging the public with um, incorporating more density in sprawling cities. Yeah, ideally I would do a build out analysis of uh, DRIs that are already in the pipeline and show how those DRIs would impact traffic compared to whether if we accommodated the growth in downtown. Yeah, that would definitely be the best approach to show more data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can hide it in mixed use buildings, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. session is Mark Wachowski. He is a transportation planner and visualization specialist from Fort Hare ITT Philadelphia office. Um, Mark engages in transportation planning and urban design. He also has design and visualization projects that include work in places such as diverse as Charlotte, North Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, Albany, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and New York City. So I invite him to come up, and we'll get his presentation going. We have a bit of time. I'll pull up a couple more files just to have them on hand to flip through them. Okie doke. Um, I was really blown away by the uh, first uh, set of presentations this morning in the same room, the uh, 360 degree uh, photospheres and, and VR. And I wanted to take a slightly different tack and show how many tools are still possible to smaller design teams, uh, perhaps projects with smaller budgets, where most of the staff might be focused on CAD drafting or a lot of analytical work of transit corridors. And maybe you have one person or two, if you're lucky, that has access to SketchUp. Um, but everyone has, of course, has access to PowerPoint. So a lot can be done even simply by uh, screen sharing 3D models and even doing some basic yet effective animation in PowerPoint. So uh, this presentation attempts to uh, show a couple examples of that. And uh, smaller firms tend to rely on a lot of static imagery that's churned out. And if you do have a transit corridor that has a lot of different iterations, say different modes, and of course different station configurations depending on the mode, um, you tend to, especially, and I did uh, in the pre-COVID times, defaulted to um, pl tr placing a lot of static images, plans, renderings next to each other and try to nudge the public to make connections. And because I had worked in 3D, those connections were already in my mind, but as I, um, I found out, as I presented those static images to the public, a lot of those connections weren't being made. And I realized now that so many people are using Teams or Zoom and staying into screens, both for internal meetings and for public presentations, there's a lot that can be done with simple screen sharing to convey things um, much more effectively than static imagery. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about the Interbar Express Feasibility Study in too much detail because this is more about the images and the 3D models that were created for the project, but a really, really quick overview of that project. Um, currently undergoing a study in New York by the MTA. It would be a 14-mile new cross-town um, high-capacity transit connection through Brooklyn and Queens. It would run along the existing Bay Ridge uh, freight corridor, which is already grade-separated. It was grade-separated in the 1920s. Um, connect up to 17 existing subway lines. I think it's served in its catchment area about a million people and a quarter, over a quarter million jobs, so definitely uh, has a lot of potential. Um, since it'd be the only cross-town connection um, on the outer ring of the boroughs, um, apart from the G-Line. And we are currently considering three modes, BRT, LRT, and conventional rail. Um, decided to call it conventional rail simply because commuter rail, the phrase has certain implications, peak only, unidirectional, but conventional rail would still be frequent and bidirectional. And we're also looking at three operating conditions, below grade, at grade, and above grade. Um, so three times three, that's te uh, technically nine different considerations we have to communicate to the uh, public. Some of them have obviously already been ruled out. You wouldn't have um, conventional rail at grade, so eight. But, you know, there are a lot of iterations and um, configurations that we want to try to communicate to the public. And more specifically, we want the public to 
focus on the trade-offs and the differences between the configurations. So not necessarily ooing and aahing over any particular mode, but oh, this one would work better for me, or this one seems like a better fit for the neighborhood because I can see how it compares to this other mode at the same time. So in the past, in the pre-COVID times, I uh, default to creating a lot of arrays of images that uh, have the different modes displayed, but um, you know, I'd be standing next to uh, static presentation boards at a meeting, there'd be no um, display, um, or even if there was a display such as we have here, um, tended to default to displaying static images there anyway. And it would be, even though I, even if I verbally communicated the trade-offs and pointed to different images, it'd still be hard to make that, the public to make a connection, oh, this mode functions this way in the space and this one would function slightly differently because. And so a very first and quick and easy step, and this can be done in PowerPoint, no 360 degree um, renderings needed, uh, no uh, virtual reality needed, is to simply um, array the images. If uh, you're rendering them from the same perspective, I rendered these in Rhino, match the perspectives, is to simply array them on top of each other, um, create a simple fade animation, and then all of a sudden I noticed when we were presenting these instead of the static images, people would point out like, oh, that grade crossing there for BRT. I actually kind of like it when conventional rail goes under the street and there's less conflict between the two modes. And it seems like such a simple thing that should be able to be picked up through static imagery, but for whatever reason, it, all, it isn't always. And so a simple animation here can help um, bridge that gap. And that was a very, I'm gonna do a really quick detour. That was a very uh, simple um, PowerPoint animation, just a fade. But you can also do slightly more complex things. Oh, I don't, I hate hearing myself talk. So let me uh, mute that for a second. It's like, why am I hearing my voice all of a sudden? So in this model, We'll listen to myself talk. Um, can we? Oh, that's fine. You can actually leave. It's almost done. All right. I just was going to cut the volume for you. Oh, I thought I muted it like this. Oh, thanks. So in uh, this scene here, let's actually switch to, uh, you can see the animation there. I pulled the model apart in Rhino, so the different layers are rendered separately as transparent PNGs and um, layered on top of each other in PowerPoint and simple animation effects, you know, um, drive along a path, for example, for the buses was applied here. Um, and that was a fairly simple, straightforward process for showing how bus lanes are imposed on an existing street or superimposed onto an existing street. Back to the main presentation here. So that's what you can do with even with static imagery to give it a bit of dynamism to help the public bridge some uh, certain connections. But I realized that since I was already doing a lot of 3D work just to create pretty images at the end of a project, now that so many meetings have, especially internal PM meetings, have shifted to Teams. Um, there's no reason why I can't bring and screen share those models earlier in the design process. So previously, uh, we had defaulted to PM meetings where I'd give them a batch of screenshots that kind of showed the different perspectives that I wanted to illustrate in a project. But you know how busy uh, PMs can be. Sometimes they didn't look at this thoroughly or they wouldn't show every single perspective in a model. So there'd still be surprises and I'd go back and uh, end up doing revisions multiple times. But if I simply drive through the model while the PMs are viewing that one actually forces them to engage. So they're making comments as they see something instead of promising to uh, review something down the road. And it allows them to spot problems earlier in the design process. So uh, I can fix them before actually uh, going on to polished renderings. So, you know, for example, they're looking at it and say, oh, wait, 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 that staircase right there, the way you've actually shown it, the way we initially proposed we're gonna have it, that's not gonna work. So we can go back and fix that now before we actually show something like that to the public or end up redoing renderings you know, right before the public meeting. And I realized that the same approach can actually be brought uh, right into public meetings since so many of them are still happening virtually. So this is a screen video recording of a Rhino uh, tour that I did 
for the IBX. So we had a variety of questions uh, related to how certain things are uh, arrayed next to each other, how they pass, how different modes pass under or over each other. And as a bit of a counter argument to some of the earlier presentations uh, today, where uh, there's obviously clear benefits to 360 degree renderings where uh, those can be easily posted on the web and people can digest them at home at their own pace. Sometimes, and this is alluded to in the early meetings too, is that sometimes it can be hard for certain audiences to engage with that, like people who are com comfortable with video games, younger people especially, will tend to see that and you know take right off and they know what to do. But um, in a lot of transit meetings we've had a difficulty getting older audiences, or, and by older, you know, anyone 30 or above even. Um, you, you kind of have to, you can't expect the audience to take the initiative, you kind of have to prod them um, along to make certain discussions or certain decisions. And this, the positives of this is that um, you can actually steer, there's obviously a lot of debate over whether you necessarily want to steer the conversation or have the public steer the conversation, but you can steer the conversation to what you want the public to focus on. So let's take a look at the staircase here, and then you actually, you know, you're driving the model, you go look at the staircase. Now let's take a look at somewhere there, uh, something over there. And if there are interruptions from the audience, but oh, by the way, um, how would this work? How does that look? You can make that detour in the model while you're touring and show them that. Um, you can anticipate that if you create a lot of 360 degree views and a lot of uh, uh, walkthroughs or fly throughs, but there's always the chance since those are pre recorded that, you know, there may be a question may pop up for some aspect of the model that you can't, maybe isn't covered by that particular animation. And of course, just to reiterate uh, what I used to do in the pre COVID times was um, print out a lot of uh, plan views, um, section views, elevation views, perspectives. Uh, you'd stand by them at the public meeting, you'd point to different um, uh, images and hope that the public has, will make the same connections that you in your mind have already made because you've been working on their project for so many months. So um, quite, um, quite a contrast to the old approach. So I uh, definitely value in-person engagement, but also uh, virtual meetings definitely have their pluses as well. And sometimes I've been gotten sort of gentle criticism, I'm sure others have gotten it too, is are we focusing so much on the uh, 3D technology that we're kind of losing other aspects of the project? And uh, my response to that is, you know, 3D is not particularly anything new. Um, way back in the day, a lot of three, uh, physical fabricated 3D models were created uh, to, engage, uh, to engage the public in a similar way. And so we're kind of only revisiting and reviving that rather than kind of going off down a new road. And uh, this is uh, self-evident too, is um, physical models tended to only be created towards the end of a project, but with the 3D models, as mentioned in other presentations as well, you can bring them back into even earlier phases of the project. You can start with simple massing um, and then move to progressively more detailed models. So a, a lot of the limitations and challenges have also been discussed in previous presentations. Um, animations do take some time. Uh, power, PowerPoint is uh, a versatile workaround, so there's uh, actually, I would say, not much excuse for not toying with animation even a little bit because everyone has access to PowerPoint. Um, 360 uh, degree renderings can be easily posted on the web. Uh, 3D models are a little more challenging. I've tried um, Google Earth, uh, Google SketchUp sometimes on the web is a little hard, and then obviously you're always gonna need a little bit of print collateral. Um, and finally, wanted to wrap up with in the same way that a lot of people have access to PowerPoint and um, 360 degree renderings can be posted on the web, not a lot of people realize that um, Adobe Reader, free and available to everyone, has 3D capabilities as well too. So this is a very simple massing model that um, created in Rhino export, I think as a 3DS and embedded as a model in Reader. So that means anyone with Reader can open the model and view and zoom to their heart's content to any aspect. Of course, um, unlike a 360 degree uh, rendering, which is um, an image wrapped around a photo with a camera placed inside, so you don't have to worry about lag or anything because you're just basically zooming around and panning around a single image. Uh, this is actual 3D geometry, so the more complex, the more sluggish the PDF tends to get. Um, that, I think, is about it. So any questions? Right under the wire, too. Yes, yep. Okay. Yeah, um, why used to be able to do this at an in-person public meeting? Do you count as 
Um, you can. So I've actually, um, if you have the laptop with the software on it, you can just hook up and drive. And before, it, it just didn't occur mentally to oh, be, be prepared and actually bring this to the physical meeting. So we almost always just default it to static imagery. Thank you. 